So I thought that this would be a good place to start this video, this footage of how we wash dishes in our van. The product I'm presenting today isn't some kind of domestic household style hot water heater, but it's actually a fairly maybe niche product you could say for situations where you're completely off grid, so good water use efficiency is an absolute priority. These days, camper vans seem to run the spectrum from essentially metal tents with the absolute minimal amenities, all the way to these giant monstrosities that pack every single household amenity possible. How you travel, where you travel, will probably determine where on that spectrum you fall. If you are looking for a hot water setup that lets you shower for a long time, use endless amounts of hot water because you're at some RV hookup so you have endless water, this product and this design is probably useless for you. For us though, when we fill up our water tank, we've got 20 gallons of water and we try to make that last as long as possible traveling to some remote locations with no ability to get more water and just no amenities nearby. But that's also coupled with the fact that I feel like I'm just getting old and soft and after numerous winters of like washing my hands and washing dishes in near freezing water, I'm kind of tired of that. So about six weeks ago, I finished building this little water heater that we've been using in our van for the last handful of trips here. And it does exactly what I wanted. It's a simple little copper canister with a 12 volt heating element inside it. And as I demonstrated at the start of this video, this isn't some product where you can just like endlessly run hot water and shower for a long time, but just like a very niche product that you could say takes the edge off and basically lets me wash my hands without completely freezing them, lets me wash dishes, etc. Now there's quite a few design choices I made about this thing so that it looks the way it does, it consumes the power it does, etc. So basically what's gonna happen in this video is I'm first gonna give a demonstration about how this thing works and provide some more details about what's installed in the van. Then I'm gonna kinda of contrast that to the other water heater options out there and why none of them did what I wanted. Then I'll actually show you how I built this one because it's the second one. The first one's already installed in the van. This one I just wanted to have to play around in the shop and do like make a couple more modifications perhaps to. And then lastly, I'll kind of talk about some of the other things I want to try out with it and some of the things I wish I could implement into this that I just don't really have the resources to. Along with this video, there should be a second video um, basically covering how I kind of prototyped and what iterations I made as I designed this thing and how it came together. Uh, that's going to be like way less refined, but it will just have some kind of raw footage that will kind of voice over all the design choices I made and some of the hurdles I came across as I was trying to get this thing to work out. So let me go over how this thing is installed and how it works. In my van, I didn't plan to have a water heater installed, so I actually didn't make a wiring run specifically for it. So to not go through the process of like gutting part of my van to get another wiring run, I basically put it on a switch on the same circuit as my automatic step. I think if both the step and the heater ran at the same time, uh, I think it would actually blow the fuse. So I've got a switch down here where I can either select for the step to be on, both to be off, or for like the water heating system to be on. Once it's on, there's a control up here on the countertop. When I flick this, it like wakes up the brains of the system and then the temperature relay can fire the water heater if needed. So right now we just fired it up. So this red light that starts to blink indicates that the heating element is on. And while we wait for this to heat up, let me show you the rest of the insulation here underneath the sink. So down here below the sink and the faucet, the entire heater is actually mounted down in this cabinet. Usually we have a trash and recycling bin that goes here and that was one of the goals is that we wouldn't lose any functional storage by installing this thing. So back in that insulated black wrap there, the entire heater essentially sits there and I've insulated it. So once it does get up to temperature, that helps it stay warm. Besides the copper assembly though, there's a little electrical brain box and that is actually in this hatch down here. This little circuit board here has the temperature controller and the relay in it. The little display that's flickering, um, that actually has like the temperature that the temperature probe is registering. And that is the entire thing right there. So we've lost like no storage space to have this thing installed in our van. Now the temperature sensor from that circuit board is taped to the side of this canister. And there's a little hysteresis there. You know, copper is a good thermal conductor, but it does have a little bit of delay. So although that is set to turn off at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, the water actually gets up to about 108, 110 degrees Fahrenheit in the tube. I'm okay with that overshoot, but I just thought I would mention it that it doesn't have like an instantaneous response. So now that the blinking light is off, we know that the water in that little canister is up to temperature. And then once we start using the foot pump, the water that comes out will be heated. Um, the first little batch of water that comes out usually is like up over 100 degrees, as I mentioned, because of that hysteresis. But pretty soon we'll empty the water out in that canister and that will kick the heating element back on. As I mentioned, even the amount of water that has come through here right now, that would be plenty for me to wash my hands and I get started in washing my dishes. 
So the rate at which I use this, that first little bit of water is the warmest, and then obviously the heater just can't keep up. So pretty soon the heating element will turn back on, and then we'll kind of get in this state where the water that's coming through here, I find is usually like 20, 30 degrees warmer than what's in the tank. That is for my rate of use. If you want to like fill hot water bottles here, this isn't going to keep up. But for just like washing dishes in a very like water efficient manner, this is exactly what I wanted. Now there has been a couple times where like I just was using the water too fast. You know, I just had like too many dishes to wash or I tried to rinse too many things at once. And when that did happen, I just went and did something else for like a minute or two so that the heater could catch back up. I mean, this is absolutely like a compromised product. If you want just like endless hot water, this isn't the solution for you. But for me, I didn't want to install something in my van that essentially like made my water use efficiency pretty poor. I didn't want to eat up some valuable storage space. And I also didn't want a system that essentially was just like heating water nonstop so that like twice a day I could actually use the faucet. This way, just a few minutes before I know I'm gonna use it, basically once in the morning, once in the evening, we can fire this thing up and the rest of the time we're not burning fuel or burning electricity to keep water warm. So to wrap up the intro of this video, let me just like formally state exactly what I wanted my little water heater to accomplish and why none of the common options I feel like work very well. You know, first and foremost is I wanted it to work with a foot pump. All of these systems basically require either a pressurized water system or if they're like an on-demand system, they require like the water to be flowing for a second or two for that heat to like kick on. So with a foot pump and how kind of like pulse the flow is, none of the instant options would work very well. Two and three are footprint and distance, and I think these are very much tied together. If you mount one of these larger heaters somewhere close to the faucet, then it takes up valuable storage space, has a pretty negative footprint, I believe. Or if you mount it somewhere that's convenient, then the travel distance from the heater to the faucet is so large that if you are using just very small amounts of water, trying to be efficient with your water use, then it just gets cold before it ever makes it to the faucet. In terms of power, I mean, the obvious one is I didn't want to install propane in my van. I've currently got a pretty robust electrical system or diesel, but my big curiosity here was, could you wire a 12 volt water heater on essentially what I would call like normal wire sizes and normal fuses, like using ATC fuses. So I wanted something that was essentially less than 30 amps of power consumption so that I could just fuse it through my regular fuse panel. I don't know of any other water heater on the market that I think draws less than 700 watts. And that one is actually a tank system, which means you've got to wait quite a while for that water to get warm. And then these last two things on the list are just kind of a little more ambiguous, but I always believe that a simple design is way more reliable. Like I think a lot of people are fans of the hydronic system. To me, I've seen enough of them fail that it's not something I want to travel with. When they do fail, it's not like this thing that I could just like run into some kind of hardware store, grab a piece of tubing and just bypass it. Like when one of these complicated systems fails, you basically can't build pressure in your water system. So you essentially have no water system. And that's not something I want to travel with. And then the last one for me is convenience. The way I built my water system is that with just two little valves, I can gravity drain the entire thing. And I didn't want to install some kind of water heater that forces me either to like use compressed air or like some kind of complicated shutdown procedure at the end of every weekend. This way I keep my convenience. I've specifically built this thing so that the water can just gravity drain out the side of it. So coming over to this column, as I alluded to, hydronic systems, I just think they're not very reliable. And when they do break, they have so many proprietary parts that it's really difficult to fix them while you're traveling. Not something I want to travel with. They're like propane camping style, like outdoor shower heaters. There's even few that claim to be ventless so you can mount them inside. But you know, besides the obvious one that they're propane based and I don't have any propane on board, most of them also rely on that water flowing for a second or two before it ignites. And as a result, that's just not very good for water use efficiency because you're always kind of waiting for that water to be flowing at least a couple seconds. Doesn't work with a foot pump. Then there's other tankless systems, both like electric ones and like more kind of RV based propane ones. Again, they all have a lag and some of the electric ones like Bosch makes a pretty nice looking unit. It draws over like 1600 Watts, I believe. And that is just actually more power consumption than I ever wanted to use for hot water. And then finally, there are some very nice, even like marine hot water heaters um, that are tanked from like isotemp. Those look like great units. Um, again, where you mount them, if it's convenient, that distance to the faucet is really long. And for me, like any tank system, I just don't wanna be heating water when I'm only using a cup or two at a time here and there. I don't wanna be heating like over a gallon of water just for that convenience. Now we're gonna go back in time and I'm actually gonna show you how I built this second canister here. As you watch this, uh, my gut reaction to watching this would have been, why don't you just buy the right adapters? We're gonna go through sort of a painful process to get these threaded ends so that this thing can screw in the end. This little port can come out the side. I looked into buying the adapters. 
and I don't know, maybe there's some industry out there that uses fittings of this size, but I could not find a way to essentially get all the right kind of combinations of fittings. If I bought like a T adapter, this little port would have been more like midway. At that point, I couldn't gravity drain the system. So anyways, I couldn't get it to work out. I wanted as much of the water to flow along the heating element as possible. I wanted the gravity drain, and this is the only way I could figure it out. So I'll just leave it at that. So when you watch this, you might think this looks dumb, but this is the only way I could figure it out to get these fittings in these locations. Now, the very first prototype I actually built was at a PVC. Uh, working with PVC is way faster, but as you see, um, in boiling water, even PVC softens up quite a bit. So kind of my big phobia of just going with the PVC version is that, you know, if the heating element kind of stayed on in here and there was no water in it to kind of buffer that temperature, then I think this thing could eventually melt. You know, that's like a real catastrophic kind of scenario, but that is why I did want to go with a copper design for my own van. And I am terrible at soldering. Anyone who's good at it that's going to watch this video is probably going to cringe. I apologize for that, but um, you know, it's a non-pressure situation, like using a foot pump in my van. This thing doesn't have to hold any pressure, it just has to be watertight, and I think it works fine for that. So what you're going to need to build this, um, something to solder or braze copper. Um, I'm terrible at it, as I said, but anyways, I got a torch, got some flux, got some paste. Then a good pipe wrench, or perhaps like some channel locks are super helpful for this. You're going to be able to need to like grab that kind of assembly really tightly so that we can tap the ends of it. And then to tap those fittings, I got a set of uh, pipe thread taps here. I basically ended up buying this kit on Amazon because I actually needed a one inch pipe tap. I didn't have one before. And this whole kit costs less on Amazon than just one of these taps locally. Uh, this is made by a company named Drill America, but I can't actually find anywhere where they're actually made all the bits. But anyways, you need some pipe taps if you're gonna make it in this method. And then I rely on an angle grinder quite a bit. And then actually this little bench sander behind me, that's gonna come in really handy too. But if you don't have one of those, um, either just putting like a flap disc on your angle grinder or like flipping a, uh, flipping a belt sander upside down works just as well. And then like the actual materials that you need to make this thing, obviously you need the heating element. Uh, this one's made by Durnord. You can get these on Amazon, proudly made in China. Uh, these guys sell these 12 volt heating elements. Now uh, this is a 300 watt model, which as I discussed is about the upper limit of what I'd wire through like a standard blade fuse or an ATC fuse. If I would basically recommend when you get this thing, dunk it in water, dry it out a few times, see if any rust develops. I had a few little rust spots on the first version I got of this, contacted the company and they said they can get surface contaminants while they're being manufactured. And after I like kind of sanded those off, then uh, yeah, it didn't come back. So that does seem to work, but I would take care of that before you have it permanently installed in case you get some rust in your water. And these also come with these silicone seals here. I actually couldn't get that to seal on a previous heater I made. So I would just run out to your local hardware store and get some O-rings and then play around with them. I'm not sure which one of these will work right now. On the first version I made, I just have a little bin of random O-rings in my shop. Uh, so I got one from there. But for this version, I actually went out and purchased some and I'll end up using one of those once we're installing this little heating unit. The copper pieces are probably the most uh, kind of specialized for this. Locally, I could only find one inch copper. Uh, this is one and a half inch copper pipe. So I got this on a Mac Master. Besides the actual pipe, you need to buy a couple of these end caps. And then we'll be modifying those by basically brazing on these uh, brass nuts to them. This is a half inch pipe size. This is a one inch pipe size. And we're gonna kind of inset those in there so that we have like threaded ends. And then to make that side port, uh, I just source these locally. These are just 3 8 inch thread by 3 8 inch pipe. And if we accidentally mess up and drill this hole too big so that this is a loose fit, then I did go out and buy a half inch pipe size as well. Um, just in case we got to go up one size, it doesn't really make a difference, but hopefully we'll nail it on the first shot. Besides that, as you saw in the van, the actual heater there is insulated. So for that, I use this EPDM, uh, just like pipe insulation. I'll put a link as to which one I exactly bought for this. This is actually from one of the earlier prototypes. You can see I've kind of put a cap in the top here so that it can go around that fitting that comes out the top. I don't quite have enough left over to make a whole new insulation piece at this point, but I did insulate it so I thought I'd point out those materials. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about more like towards the very end as we're talking about like what updates for the future is like how I wired this thing. Uh, for all the prototyping, I kind of used this Jengus thing here, but for the actual part that's in my van, I ended up sourcing this like 30 amp temperature controlled circuit board off the internet. Unfortunately, like between the time I bought this to the time of making this video, they've discontinued this part. This is a Alekbi, which is another like straight out of China company, but 
I'm a little sad they discontinued this specific one. Looks like they have a slightly different version now, but again, we'll talk about that at the end. So yeah, I think we're gonna most mainly focus on how I made this thing. And then after that, uh, we'll just talk about kind of what I would do better for the next version. And actually, I already have some plans for another version I'm gonna try out. So, all right, let's make this little pipe thing. Step one, cut the copper pipe to length. This step is quite easy. I cut mine to nine inches long. You can go a little bit shorter, but you can't go any shorter than the length of that heating element. And you could probably go a little longer if you wanted as well, but I just settled at nine inches. To make the cut, I used a miter saw. You should do whatever makes you feel safe. Step two, making the end caps. This step kind of sucks. I couldn't find any like copper adapters that would be like the right gender and the right size like reduction and everything to make this work. So we're going to braise or solder together the brass nuts and those copper end caps. I'm gonna do the smaller half inch pipe thread size nut first and then we'll move on to the bigger one. So the general process goes like this. First off, I drill a centered hole in the end of one of those copper end caps that is just slightly smaller than the inner diameter of those threaded nuts. You wanna size this so that after we've soldered these two pieces together, we can essentially run a tap through both layers so that the threads continue through both. Then once I've got that sized correctly and drilled out, I go ahead and solder the two pieces together. And this is where using a pair of channel locks or like a pipe wrench and kind of securing it somehow makes it nice and easy to hold it securely so you can tap the threads through. And then when it's time to do the bigger nut, actually on the second version, I was just trying to work fast and I didn't do a very good job centering my hole but uh, do as I say, not as I do. I'll end up just putting so much solder in this that it essentially just fills that void anyways. All right, so on side two, way more of a pain in the butt. Besides me being a dumbass and drilling my hole off, uh, you basically wanna cut everything around the circle off and then we'll start to fine, ten, fine tune the fit so that this can slip inside here. I do some like crude cutting off with the angle grinder to get kind of rid of the corners. And then I go over to that bench sander and basically start finessing the fit so that I can just slide that nut right into the end cap. I've got pretty good fitting there against the edge. Pretty minimal gap there. Once I am happy with the fit, I go ahead and solder this thing together as well. And then I go ahead and tap it. Anyways, this step really does kind of suck, but it was the only way I could figure out to uh, get all those fittings in the places I need. After that step, things get a little easier. We're gonna essentially attach these end caps to the pipe. The only thing I can tell you to be careful of is like just don't overheat the pipe because then you could actually re-unmelt that nut that we just cut and tapped in. And now all we've got left is that little side port. So for this, once again, I'm gonna drill a hole and then try to finesse it so it's just big enough that I can kind of friction fit that side fitting through. Before I end up brazing or soldering, I do go ahead and check for any interference to make sure that that heating element isn't gonna be hitting the inside of the nut. And once I'm happy with it, I go ahead and solder it. I think a good way to test to make sure you've got some good contact on this little side nut is to essentially take a wrench and see if you can spin it. And if you can't, I think it's got plenty of strength for this application. Okay, I think that's about all the cleanup I'm gonna do on it. Ironically, I had a big drip of the solder. Whoops. Ironically, when I was soldering this end, I had a big drip of solder onto these threads and I couldn't get it off. Went to go recut the thread as a result. And then that fitting was in the way of the tap. So now I've got some nice teeth on it. It doesn't really matter. Anyways, uh, this obviously needs to be washed really well before it's ready to go, but that's basically the entire thing, right? So then here I put in a barbed fitting, had another barbed fitting here in elbow, and then the heater goes through there. So. That's how you make this canister. So that there, that's the finished product. You know, it was quite a bit uglier and rougher looking before, but you know, between like using a file and then using some sandpaper, like you can clean it up quite a bit. You know, I've got some kind of chewing marks from like all the uh, channel lock action on the ends of it. 
But yeah, it's not pretty, but it's gonna be covered in insulation. Speaking of that insulation, just to quickly touch upon that, uh, this is actually the piece I use for most of my prototyping. As you can see, it slides over like that to make this end cap. Um, I actually made another one here. This is what it basically looked like. I just cut a little circle, punched a hole out in the middle, and then glued it into the top here. And to do that gluing, I just found some like rubber uh, foam adhesive locally. Anyways, you know, that step probably doesn't make too much of a thermal difference, but I think it just helps it look nicer. The reason I didn't use this in the van though is because I decided to actually make this end cap just a bit longer. That way these terminals are essentially protected. So there's not a chance I'm gonna like accidentally bump these when they're sitting there in the back of that cabinet. Um, besides that, I think the only other real thing to talk about is wiring and kind of where I like to take this thing or like what I want to do as I play around with it in this next little iteration. So for basically all the wiring I did uh, in my prototyping, I ended up using this just like temperature controller and then just like a standard little automotive relay. Nothing special about this, but just the way you wire this, the controller and everything, it's just a little less integrated feeling than uh, this product I ended up finding on the internet. This circuit board, you know, straight out of China for sure, but I actually think like all the contact pins on it look really nicely done. The relay on it is quite substantial. Uh, yeah, I like the way you can program it, everything. I was really happy about it. The temperature probe just plugs in, everything's integrated. But then as I said, between the time I ordered this, you know, figured out my prototype, and then now making this video, it's been discontinued. The temperature sensor on it, in the van, I've just got this tape down to the side of it. You know, copper is a pretty good thermal conductor, so that's how it kind of reads its temperature. The new updated version of this thing looks like it's got kind of a threaded temperature sensor. You could maybe still just tape it to the side, but it looks like it's designed to be like basically installed, like maybe through another hole in the side of this. And I just like to minimize the amount of points to where this could potentially leak. So that temperature sensor just doesn't seem as nice and the circuit board just looks a little different, but I wish they still made that. Speaking of circuit boards and such though, what I, you know, like if this was gonna be a product that someone would actually sell, it would be really nice to have some kind of like safety shut off so that if it sensed like any temperature over essentially like boiling point, that's just like an unrealistic value. It means like something has gone wrong and it would just like shut the system down. So I don't have any kind of like safety device on this. I do think being in a copper fitting, um, I've got kind of a wide margin of error before anything bad would happen, but some kind of safety, either sensing that there's no water in it or that the temperature has exceeded the boiling point, a safety shut off would be really nice. Besides that, the other reason I wanted to build this kind of second heater is I like to play around with some higher wattage heating elements. At that point, I could like no longer wire it through like a standard like ATC fuse panel. But I am just curious, like if I put a 600 watt heating element in here, could I get like a 40 or 50 degree temperature rise to the waters that's coming through the faucet? Um, you know, I'm just curious about that. You know, even 600 watts, that's like cooking something at a fairly low temperature on our stove. You know, I only run this thing maybe 15, 20 minutes a day max. So at that point, it's like no different than just cooking another meal in terms of like electrical consumption. So to me, my electrical system could handle that. I've also considered going to just like a 110 volt heating element, but at this point I haven't found any that are like less than 1500 watts. Seems like all the 110 volt AC units um, are just like super higher wattage and I don't really want to go down that road. So that's basically the heater assembly there. You know, I hope I conveyed properly what this is and isn't. You know, it's not going to replace like a hot water shower or anything in your van. But as I said, for me, I just want to take a little bit of the edge off, off that like near freezing water in the winter. And this works perfectly for that. I hope everyone found that interesting. You know, hopefully in the next week or so, I'll put out that second video with like kind of all the uh, different kind of prototype iterations I went through. And um, you know, that might inspire you to like take this in a slightly different way. And if you do and you find something that works even better, you know, let me know. Anyways, uh, as always, thank you guys so much for watching.